Go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. You say that and everybody begins to get excited. Don't get too excited. We're not going to stay there real long. Revelation chapter 13. We're thankful to be here. We're thankful to have the opportunity. I've known Brother Brandon for a while now and we appreciate him very much in the Lord. He has become a very true friend to me and uh, one who is very close and dear to my heart. And I appreciate him. And I appreciate uh, his family, and I appreciate the church where he comes from, and uh, all that uh, the Lord is doing with him. And I appreciate the opportunity of the church to allow me to come this week. It's very humbling to have the ability and the opportunity to come be with you, ask you to pray for me. Uh, I'm not the brightest of preachers, and I sure, is, uh, I, 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 I sure am not the best preacher by a long shot. And uh, my goal this week is not to be either one, but to be true to the Lord. And I ask you to pray for me that I could do that, that I could be true to the word of the Lord and what the Lord would put on my heart to preach and just deliver his message. I ask you to pray for me that I'd be able to do that this week. That's my goal. We want to read just the first few verses uh, here in chapter 13. We're going to read probably down through verse 8 and uh, to, to, to get a try to begin to get across the thought that the Lord's laid on my heart this evening. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and, his great, and, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it, was, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And I'm going to stop reading there with verse 8. This tells us, obviously, probably a section of Scripture that we're all very familiar with about John describing this beast here in Revelation chapter 13. And he's about to go into uh, talking about the number of the beast and uh, the, the ideas with that, but there's a statement that John makes here that I want to narrow down on that I, I think a lot of times, at least for a long time, I've, I've overlooked this idea being included in the scripture. And once I began to, to recognize the, the strength, I guess you would say, the, the meaning, the understanding that can, can be gained from that statement, I began to see things from a, a, a good bit different angle when I began to see them in this way. John tells us that, uh, of course, about the beast. He tells us, kind of describes the beast and some, gives us some information about the beast and that he's going to continue 42 months. This is during the time of the tribulation. And that one of the things that he tells us is that the whole world is going to worship this beast. The whole world's going to look to this beast. The whole world is going to value, is going to kneel, going to praise this beast except for one group of people. And that group of people is the people who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now this has been given to us all the way through the Scripture. There's a book, obviously, that is the Book of Life of the Lamb slain from when? From the foundation of the world. Now it's important for us to understand that timing. There's a reason that John included that for us, that this Lamb was not slain 2,000 years ago, this lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And we're still talking about the same lamb. We're still talking about Jesus Christ. But what John is telling us here 
that Christ was as good as slain from the foundation of the world because Christ was already determined to go to the cross of Calvary for us. Christ had already made His mind up, if you will, that He was going to go to the cross at Calvary. And so things began to build themselves. Things began and God began to operate from the perspective that Christ was already slain even from the foundation of the world. We cannot miss that point. Christ stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's not the only place in the scripture that this is mentioned. There's quite a few other places that are mentioned. John chapter 17 verse 24 alludes to this idea of Christ, of course, being as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The beginning of the book of John, the gospel of John, uh, speaks of Christ as the word of God, the word of God from the beginning. And the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That speaks of Christ being the word of God, and as the word of God, he was with God from the beginning. We know that Christ is Alpha and Omega. That is to describe Christ in a way that Christ was not created. Christ is a part of the Godhead who has always been. Ephesians chapter 1 makes the statement, verse 4 and verse 5, talking about that we were chosen in Christ from the foundation of the world. That there were some things that were determined from the foundation of the world. This, this cannot be, uh, you cannot negate that point in the Bible. Now, what's amazing is that God has, through this, offered salvation to all of mankind. And that whosoever would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Acts chapter 2 mentions uh, an idea very similar to this. So when we look back on that, you know, so kind of look back, and sometimes you look back before the cross, and one of the things that I've been asked, one of the things that I've studied quite a bit as a pastor is, what were things like in the Old Testament? I think it's pretty clear by the scriptures that at the cross there were some things that changed. There were some things that are different now than uh, it, 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 that were not in place back then. One, one of that is that uh, we would receive the Spirit of God in a way that's different than what happened before the cross. And that the, the Bible talks, and Jesus even mentioned to the disciples, He said, now is the Spirit of God with you, but soon He shall be in you. It's something, that, something that's about to change. That the, the, the church would be embodied by the Spirit of God, it's spoken of as a new creature in Christ Jesus, and some things that took that, that took place are a little bit different. So that thing, you know, that idea of being kind of there. Often, one of the questions that you that you face or that's presented is, is well, is salvation different in the Old Testament? A lot of things you you find that that people discuss. One of the issues that people discuss. You hear a lot of talk about grace and works, and the reason is that you can take with with. Pretty much any plan of salvation that's ever been presented in the world, whether whether false or whatever the case is, if anybody ever presents a, some sort of plan of salvation, you can put it one of two categories, either it's grace or it's works. And in fact, every salvation, uh, plan of salvation that's ever been presented to mankind, save for the plan of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, is actually a, a, a works-based salvation. And the reason that is the case is because it's the only two avenues that could be taken. And that's the nature because works and grace are oil and water. They're opposite of each other. And either God gave it or either it's earned. You cannot have it both ways. And there's you know, maybe some that try to take and say, well, it's a combination. That Maybe you get this and then you do this. It's some kind of, you cannot mix the two. And Paul actually works off that idea over in Romans chapter 4 when he's talking about Abraham. Then if the reward is reckoned of works, then it's given by debt. In other words, if we've worked for it, then at some particular time after we've worked, 
maybe for a moment, if, if salvation were to come through works, that maybe for a moment in time, once we've gotten the work from complete, then God owes a man salvation. And God doesn't owe a man anything. And never will. And so Paul determines there that salvation is not reckoned of works. It's not through debt. God does not owe man anything. That salvation is reckoned by grace. It's given to us. It is a gift. And so then is that, has that, in, in any particular time, has that ever changed? Is what was the case in the Old Testament? And sometimes we begin to look at the covenants in the past and we begin to read about the covenants and we read about the law and there's oftentimes you find some confusion when it comes to the ideas of law and say, well, what happened in the Old Testament concerning the law? What was God's expectations for man during that period of time? What's God's expectations for man today? That's really the question that I want to try to deal with. Because what you find as you dig into the Bible is that what God's expected from man has not changed and never will change. From the foundation of the world, from, from the time that sin entered into the world, to the last man that will ever be saved, God's expectations are never going to change for what he expects from mankind. So let's go back for a moment and look at the law. I want, I want to kind of back up for a moment and, and, and consider the law and the idea that the law presents. One of the things that God did through the covenants is he made quite a bit of promises to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, you can read of those. You can read some of it in 12 and in 15 and 17, 18. We begin to see the reaffirmation of those of God's covenant with Abraham and some of the promises and things that God made to Abraham and what God promised. To me, one thing that's actually pretty interesting about that covenant is that, that God maybe tells Abraham a thing or two and he tells him a little bit here and then the scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, I believe it is, that he says that God, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Let's see that salvation there. Abraham was saved. And then God begins to tell Abraham, okay, here's what I'm going to do for you. And it's almost as if that now that you're saved, this is what I'm going to do. These are the promises. This, this is what I'm going to give you. So there were a lot of people for years who discussed after the covenants of Abraham. There was one of the discussions that were, was there, one of the things that God was discussing with Abraham during that period of time was about airship. God told him, I am your shield, I am, that's what he said, I am thy shield, I am thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham, just in my own words, said, what are you going to give me seeing that I go childless and I have no heir of my estate? I've got nothing, I've got nobody to pass anything down to. God goes on to, of course, tell him that's not always going to be the case. You're going to have a child, and that through this child is going to come the promised seed, Jesus Christ. I say, well, who's the heir? God goes and tells them, of course, that they're going to be going to go into Egypt and serve them for a while and he would eventually bring them out and then God gives the covenant at Sinai. He said, okay, I'm going to let you go in and possess the land that I, that I swore unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. I'm going to let you go in and do that. But by the way, if you're going to be an heir of Abraham, you're going to keep my law. And if you don't keep my law, then you're not, you're not an heir. Now let me ask a question that I think is a very obvious question. Who kept the law? There was one true heir, right? There was one man who kept the law. And that man is Jesus Christ. Apart from Christ, no man kept the law. So we look at that and it's okay, salvation came by the law. Well, if salvation came by the law, then that's very interesting because no man 
kept the law. And if we were saying that salvation came by the law, then either one of two things happened. And that's where we have to back up for a moment. Say, well, did God intend for us, did God intend forever for any man, even from the moment that He gave Moses the law at Mount Sinai, did God intend for any man to be saved through the law? God, who knows all things, who knows the end from the beginning, did He ever intend for anybody to be saved through the law? Not that covenant. So there's a couple of things that you've got to ask. I mean, at that particular point, either God made a mistake, or that's not what God had planned to take place. Either God messed up by giving man the law, which we know is not the case, or either God intended for the law to do something else. Which Paul tells us very clearly in Romans chapter 7 that the law is not bad in itself. In fact, the law shows us that we are dead. One of the interesting things about salvation is that Salvation can be summed up by death to the law. If you're going to be saved, you've got to, you've got to become dead to the law, which we become by the body of Christ. One of the things I often do, if, any, if I ever encounter anybody that, that would believe in some other type of salva salvation in, in any other particular time or whatever the case is, that on, uh, the fir one of the first things that I ask them is, okay, how, did, how were they able to circumvent the law because you can't be saved through the law and in some way you've got to be able to bypass the law and the only way to bypass the law is in the body of Christ because Christ kept the law from, for us and we've become dead to the law by his body I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8 real quick Hebrews chapter 8. I hadn't left the idea in Revelation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually mention that in, in just a moment. And one of the things you have to do when you're thinking, again, when you're going back through the covenants that are, that are mentioned in the Scripture and you're studying these covenants, you have to bear in mind that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. That God knew the end from the beginning. The question that I just presented about did God make a mistake? That's it. That, and I'm not being facetious. I'm not trying to be uh, irreverent when I say that because we know the obvious answer to that question. But yet the high writer of Hebrews actually presents a very similar idea in Hebrews chapter 8. In verse 6 he says, But now hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator, obviously this is Christ, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which, is established, or which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant, that's the law, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. In other words, if the law brought salvation, God would have never looked for another way. Or God would have never prophesied that there was going to be a new covenant, which he did in the book of Jeremiah. Y'all remember one of the statements that Christ made in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed? And he said, nevertheless, excuse me, back that up just a little bit. He said, let this cup pass from me. The Son of God, prayer to his Father was to let the cup of the cross pass from him. What Christ is asking is that there, if there is any other means of salvation other than me going to that cross, let salvation come that way. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but that but thine. Do you think if there were another means of salvation, God would have ever allowed his son to die on that cross at Calvary? 
Do you believe that God would have poured his wrath out upon his son if there were some other means of salvation, if there were some other way that this could have been brought to mankind without killing the Lord Jesus Christ, without his wrath being poured out upon, the, uh, upon Jesus on the cross at Calvary? Do we believe God would have done that? The answer to that question is no. But there's only one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. And what we find is that each covenant is an unveiling of the fact that we need Jesus Christ. Each covenant is an unveiling of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he's come into the world and that man is depraved. We are sinners and we cannot help ourselves. But God has so graciously given us a means of salvation through Jesus Christ. So let's go back for a moment. Let's, re let's remember some people in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us very quickly, Genesis chapter 6, about a man who lived before the flood named Noah. Let me just, let me just, I tell you what, let me just turn back and read that. This is Genesis chapter 6. To me, it's a very interesting. I've always looked at it, I guess, one particular way. One day the Lord helped me see it a little bit differently. Verse 5, And God saw, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. You have the description of mankind. Awful state that mankind's in. Nothing good in him at all. And then we have verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What kind of man was Noah? Was Noah really that much different from the other men on the earth at that time? I don't think Noah was an awful man, but Noah was not perfect. Noah was a sinner. Noah was a sinner just like the other men that were on the earth. And maybe the violence that was in Noah's heart was not near as much as the rest of the earth. Maybe the degree of the evilness of Noah was not very much at all. But yet he was still evil. And the point is that what I saw for a long period of time as I would read this scripture is all of the earth was really bad but Noah was good. And that's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that all of the earth was really bad, but there was one man that sought God. There was one man that sought forgiveness of his sins. There was one man that sought a, a, a cleansing from the evil in his heart. And that man's name was Noah. And so Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Noah found grace because Noah needed grace. Because he was not a perfect man. Abraham. The Bible says believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In other words, Abraham was saved by grace. Abraham was a sinner. I, I can go through the Bible and give you a few different sins and mistakes that Abraham made. And Abraham was a sinner. Job made the statement that he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall dwell in the earth in the latter day. And though the skin worms destroy my body, this is my own words, those skin worms destroy my body, yet I shall see him with mine eyes and not another. Job knew a lot. So what's God's expectations for mankind? And have they changed? 
And so maybe it's the case tonight. There's one thing maybe that hung me up for a little bit, uh, a little bit of time was, okay, so I understand that, 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 that who Jesus was and I understand maybe a little bit about what God did for me, but how can I be saved? What does God expect me to do for me to be saved? What is salvation? We talk about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith. There's so many different words that, that, that we use to describe it. And, and, and sometimes if we're not careful, I'm afraid if, if I'm not careful, I can cause more confusion in some ways in the past. But salvation is so simple. Salvation is not you doing anything. That's what I've just proven to you. It's not a work. It's not an act. It's not something that you do. It's something that God does. It's something that God does for you. And say, well, how, do, how can I get saved? What do I do that I could be saved? It's when you truly, that, that you seek God to do something for you and you put your faith in Him that He would save you through the Lord Jesus Christ, that God would do something for you that you can't do for yourself. There's, a, there's always been false ideas even surrounding the idea of Christ. For a long time it was just baptism. There's a lot of folks it's just baptism for salvation. And I'm afraid that what is taking that baptism for salvation place is the sinner's prayer. We'll just repeat these words and put you in water. I mentioned, I actually mentioned this statement yesterday, but I had a kind of a, an acquaintance, I guess you would say, that made a post on Facebook and made a confession of faith and was inviting people to his baptism. And I was thankful to see it. And so I, 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 I began as immediately as I saw it, and I, I began to kind of look a little bit. And I said, well, I wonder where he's going to church. Where, who's going to baptize him? So I, I began to look through it, and I found where, he, where he'd been going to church, and it was a little church. I'm not going to call the name or anything of that nature. But I, I began to look, and I said, well, I wonder what, kind of, what, they, what they stand for. They, they, really, I, they didn't have any denomination that was listed, look, maybe non-denominational. So I, I didn't know. I wanted to see, what do they, what do they stand for? I couldn't find a whole lot of information about that, so I, I, I just began to listen to a message. I said, well, I'm just going to hear what the man preaches. I'm going to hear what he has to say. He preached the message, and from what I heard, he did a pretty good job. What a whole lot in the message that I would have just straight up disagreed with. He got to the end of the message, and he turned to the sinner, began to preach to the sinner for a particular amount of time, and he mentioned a lot that I would have agreed with. He mentioned repentance. He mentioned faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he got done, he asked the congregation to bow their head and close their eyes, and he mentioned the prayer. And he didn't just lead them in, you know, and exactly you say these words. It was kind of haphazard a little bit in that. But after that, he made a statement that really threw me up for a loop. My wife, Crystal, was listening to it with me. We were listening to it together. And he made the statement. He said, if you said that, if you said that prayer, just raise your hand. And he said, if you're listening on live and you, you, you said that prayer, he, he said, I want you to email me. He said, because you're saved. And I told Crystal, I said, a fine fault right there. No man, no man has the right to tell you where you stand with God. No man has not only does not have the right, no man has the ability to tell you where you stand with God. They say, well, you get into this idea of it's got to, you know, the words, and you've got to have the words right, and you've got to say something about this, and you've got to say something about that. The Bible tells us that there was a man one day that smote himself on the breast, and he didn't even feel worthy to look up to heaven, and he said this, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he went away to his house justified. 
The Bible tells us about David in Psalm, 8, in, in Psalm 18, excuse me, in verse 6, that David, you can read there about how David is going back to discuss his salvation. The, 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 he talks about the pains of hell got a hold of him. And that you can see the conviction upon the heart of David as he's writing in Psalm 18. And so what did David say he did? He said, I cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard my distress. I cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard my supplication. And he saved this old sinner. That's pretty much what David said. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, actually is what it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall, shall be saved. That call is not just saying some words. That's a cry of desperation, a cry of despair, with absolutely no hope in you, but all your hope in Jesus Christ. And they say, well, what is salvation? Salvation is very simple. It's Jesus Christ. And that he has come from the foundation of the world to bring life to mankind. To give us the opportunity to be saved. And tonight, God's not willing that any man would perish. If you're here lost tonight, God's not willing for you to perish. He wants you to be saved. And you say, well, what do I need to do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Call on the name of the Lord and God will save your soul. For a long time, I got into a when I was young, I got into a bunch of music I really should have never been in. For whatever reason, I came across a man one day that had played an instrument in one of those bands I used to listen to. And he got into that idea a little bit. His father was dying. And his father's dying wish was for him to be saved. And so in the hospital room, he got beside his father and he repeated the sinner's prayer and his father was thrilled and he walked out. And he said, I walked out in the same shape I walked in. He said, because you can say something in your head and not mean it in your heart. He said, but when I got home, what I had done began to eat at me. And he said, I knew that what I had done was lied to my father on his deathbed. And he said, I got in my bathroom, on the floor on my knees, and I cried unto the Lord, and the Lord saved my soul. He said, now that time I truly cried out to him. And the Lord saved me. Zechariah talks about, and Zechariah has a vision in chapter 3, about Joshua at the time. Joshua was the high priest at the time. And the judgment scene with Joshua standing before the Lord. And it said there's one there to accuse him. And one of the descriptions that we see there about Joshua is that he's got a filthy garment on as he's before the Lord. And that filthy garment always in the Bible represents the righteousness of man. And so we see Joshua, who is the high priest of the nation of Israel, with the filthy garment on, that he is a, he's still a man. Even raised to the position of high priest in Israel, he is still a man with no righteousness at all. But he was a man who had trusted the Lord. And God rebuked the devil, his adversary. And he told him, he said, you take that dirty, that dirty garment off of him. Put him on a clean garment. Put him on a new garment. Which would be representative of the righteousness of Christ. Today God's expectations for man have never changed. Salvation has been the same from one end and it will always be the same. 
You say, well, what do I need to do to be saved? You need to humble yourself before God. Call on His name. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just that simple. Christ gave His life for you. Christ gave His life at the cross at Calvary to give you the opportunity to have eternal life and tonight you can be saved. You call on the name of the Lord. I know this by the Scripture. I know this by the Word of God, which is most important. But not only do I know it by the Word of God, I know it by experience. Because there was a time, quite a few years ago, a revival on Tuesday night, and I didn't want to go to church. But my mom and daddy carried me anyway. And the Lord began to convict my heart. In that church, I prayed three or four times. I went out to the restroom, and I got on my knees, and I prayed three or four times. And I did everything I knew to do. But I could not do it myself. I got on my knees in between them pews, and I called on the Lord, and he saved my soul. Tonight, if you'll trust the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll cry out to the Lord for mercy, through Jesus Christ tonight, you can have eternal life. It's been that way from the beginning, and it'll be that way to the end. And every man that's ever been saved has called on the name of the Lord, and God saved him. Salvation is when you look to God to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And tonight you can have that. When you look to him, you can have eternal life while we have a verse of a song.